Amen. You may be seated, but you don't have too long. Because we're going to jump right in. Just want to share just uh, just a few things, and then we're going to lay hands on everybody. Amen. Hallelujah. Also, want to let you know this next weekend, you're going to have, we've got a, we were preparing a special surprise for you. How many like surprises? Does anybody like to know about the surprise before it comes? Me too. Amen. Hallelujah. I have a hard time, especially you'll t- Tina will tell you, like, whenever I get a gift, I have a hard time keeping it till the date. Amen. Till Christmas or birthday or Mother's Day. And, you know, I just, I just love to get it and give it. But uh, tomorrow, we're actually doing something really special. Uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, and throughout this week. How many know that God gave man a garden? Amen. And how many of you know that ever since that the, the enemy came in and he tried to take what God gave in fellowship in the image of God in the earth, he was really creating a place and a people that would have authority and have dominion. And I believe that God is still looking for a garden. Amen. And so we've actually decided to build God a garden. And so when you come next week, you're going to encounter, so we're actually this week, we're having a prayer garden built. And it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be amazing. It's going to have great little uh, like stone sitting areas and stuff like that to where, I mean, Jesus is still looking for people who can come pray for an hour. Hallelujah. And when we were doing it, I said, hey, let's make sure it's not like wrought iron because that gets hot during the summer. We don't want anybody to burn their biscuits. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And so that's going to be going in this week because honestly, it's a, it's a small piece of our property that we get to say, God, we want to give you a garden. Because how many know, listen, God is in the business of making things beautiful. Amen? And so uh, everybody next week, when you, when you get here, there'll be a whole lot more uh, color and beauty and foliage. And uh, it's going to be a great time. So very excited about that. It's been a long time coming. And um, we've been working with the designers and whatnot. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. You know, sometimes you can't do everything, but you got to do something. Amen. And just to encourage your heart, I mean, even during the offering, you know, uh, Emma, Emma loves to give. You know, my daughter Emma, she loves to give. You know, and, you know, the, Isaiah says the child shall lead them, amen? Jesus said, unless you be like one of them, you can't come to me. And there's something about a childlikeness and a simplicity. And she turned to, uh, she turned to Tina, she's like, I need some cash, mama. And Tina's, all, Tina's always got little cash hidden different places. And she was looking at all of her cash hidden places, but she, it seemed like, well, I've done, you know, already gave that or done, done that, you know. And so Emma's like, I see her sitting there and I'm going, oh man, my wallet's not on me, you know. And, uh, but, but how many of you know that God always hears, hears our prayers? And that God will oftentimes put the answer to your prayer in close proximity. And so right as she was praying and I saw her sitting there and I was kind of checking, I was like, Lord, what can I do? Somebody walked over and gave me cash. Like said, hey, I want to just sow this into you. And how many of you know, listen, it wasn't given for me. It was something that God put in my hand so that he could answer somebody else's prayer. And I, and I got ready to just turn around and give it. And and I, I felt Emma behind me be like, that's my harvest. That's that didn't you Emma? She's like, that's my answer to my prayer. And I want to tell you, listen, some of us are going to be the recipient of blessing, not just for us, but so God can answer somebody else's prayer. Amen. And it's that childlike faith. And I want to encourage you. I've seen people before that said, God, if you'll do this, I'll do that. Has anybody ever prayed a prayer like that? Get ready for God to do this and never forget the that you promise. It says in Job 22, it says that when you, when you make your prayer, it'll hear you, but when you pay your vow, has anybody ever made a vow to God? I remember years ago, I don't have time to go into the whole story. Well, sure I will. The, uh, <laughs> Tina and I were, we, um, we were about to be married. We weren't married yet. And I was out in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, she was in Virginia Beach. And I was getting ready for a meeting and uh, I was watching, I had like Christian television on, I think it was TBN or something like that. And it was like, they were like, you know, doing, they were doing a fundraiser. And has anybody ever called in a pledge when you didn't have the money to make good on it? My mom said, I, I used to like the, the Jerry, Jerry Lewis telethons. I used to, man, I used to call and promise so much. Man, my heart always be so moved, right? I would like everything I had be like, like allowances for the next five years, right? But I would just be so moved, I would respond. And then I would tell my people, my parents what I did. They're like, Jason, you can't do that. Like, I mean, you don't have like, like you had to give what you've got, not what you, but how many of you know that's faith? And a child doesn't know. Because they think that everything they need, their, 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 their father's going to get to them. Amen? And I remember, um, uh, you, know, you know, calling up, and I remember it was very specific. I, I felt to give $176. Now, I didn't have a pot to pee in back then. 
So like $176 back then was like 18,000 to me now. Okay. I mean, it was like, you know, just, you know, I, I, I uh, just got out of prison. I mean, I didn't, it didn't have a whole lot working for me. Amen. And, uh, but I had faith. I had faith. And then, uh, but how many of you know, it's not enough to have faith. You got to have faith and follow through. Amen. And God, God did some great things for us out there and, you know, introduced us to some great people. And, um, you know, I got to spend some time with like, uh, he, you know, Hagen Jr. and his son and stuff while I was out there and just different, the Lord's opening up great doors. And, um, and it was just very interesting, all these like God connections. And I got back and I got busy and I forgot that I had made that phone call. But you know, God didn't forget. And it says in Job 22 that when you, when you pray, not only will God hear you, but when you pay your vow, it says in verse 28, that then you can decide and decree a thing. You can decide and decree a thing because one goes from petition, the other is command and authority. Decide and decree a thing and the Lord will establish it and cause the light of his favor to shine on your ways. Fast forward years later, let's see what it would have been, that was 2003, um, 2010 that we built that house in Fort Mill? Seven years. Seven years forward, and I'd forgot. Has anybody ever forgot something for seven years? And I've got a really good memory. And so for me to forget something for seven years, I mean, that's like, you can tell the enemy was working hard. Amen. And, uh, and I remember we were building this house, and there were several different challenges that kind of came up financially. And the very last thing as we were moving toward closing, it was like, like everything was good until it wasn't. Has anybody ever got one of those calls? And they're like, man, you've got somebody stirred up. Like all of a sudden, the people that are pulling this thing apart and trying to keep you from doing, I'm like, come on, the devil don't want me to have my house. Hallelujah. And in that moment, God said, you made a vow to me. And how do you know? God didn't invite the warfare, but he was giving me a key to open a door. Amen. And I said, oh, that's right. So I called back, I called, I called that ministry back and I said, hey, Seven years ago, I, I called up and I pledged to give $176 and I have not given it. They're like, you know, so many people call and make pledges they don't give. We don't ever have somebody call back. <laughs> and I said, well, I, I want to make good on this because it's my word. And I told you and I wasn't, I, did, I didn't try to get out of it. I just, I forgot. It's just, it slipped my mind. How many of you say, if I, if I would have known, I would have done it, right? But God brought it to my memory and I got super excited recognizing that he wanted to give me a key. And so when I did it, all of a sudden I get a call from our mortgage broker. He goes, I don't know what you just did. He goes, but all of a sudden everything got passed through. There were several other faith things that we did. I remember, you know, somebody walked in and gave me $500 and I went and gave it to somebody I didn't like. That was another thing. You and I both ministered with him. But uh, the, <laughs> the <laughs> tell you after the meeting who it is. But it was one of those things where I knew the guy was trying to use me. I knew he was just, you know, he was one of those opportunists trying to get into where I was at and then would just talk about you behind your back. But I remember somebody came up and gave me 500 and I needed a whole lot more. And so the Lord told me that if I bless my enemies, he'll bless my seed, amen. And so I went and I said, well, listen, I, I can think of somebody I don't like, so I'm gonna go pour hot coals on his head, amen. I mean, can we just get serious? Are y'all, y'all too sanctified? And I did, I blessed. And so it was those two things together. The mortgage broker is, I don't know what you just did. I said, well, I just did two things that required a lot of humility. Required a lot of humility. He said, but everything that was holding you up has just moved on your behalf. I mean, $500 and 176. $676 was keeping us from our dream house. And a lot of times it's just simple obedience in small areas that'll open up great big doors, amen? And I'm encouraging you with that because God is wanting to take you from simply praying a prayer, wishing that God would, to the authority, to where you can decide to decree some things. Because yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours is the glory. In Luke 24, 49, Jesus said, behold, I send the promise. Come on, say the promise the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. He said, I've got a promise with your name on it. And I want you to stay where you're at until you get it. And I don't know about you, but I've seen so many people that had promises with their name on it that couldn't stay where they were at until they got it. They got antsy. 
All of a sudden, God told me to be here and to do this until he did that. And three months later, either God's bipolar or they are. Because God has now changed his mind and sent him to go do something else that's a little bit easier right before their harvest came into their life. Amen? And I want to tell you, the promises of God are yes. And he's looking for an amen. You see, on his end, it's always yes. But he's looking for an amen in the earth. You know what an amen is? Agreement. And you can't have agreement without alignment. Amen means so be it. Amen was simply that what Mary said when, 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 when Gabriel gives her this incredible word about the power of the Most High overshadowing her and her conceiving by the Holy Spirit. She said, let it be unto me according to your word. You know what that was? That was a whole lot of words to say amen. That means when God gives you a promise that looks bigger than what you think is possible, you don't need to, to, to bring this idea or, well, God, maybe you could do it this way or maybe you could do it that way. You definitely don't want to be like Zachariah to say, well, I'm too old. I've seen too much. You don't even need to be like Mary saying, well, I just haven't had what I need to get to get that to happen. Hallelujah. You just simply say, amen. God is looking for an amen in the earth. The promises of God are thrown out and he's looking for someone who says, I'm in. I'm gonna grab it and I'm gonna say I'm all in to what God has promised to me. So he said, I send the promise of my father upon you, but wait in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Now, power was not a new term to the disciples. There have been several times in their three and a half years of walking with Jesus that Jesus had given them increments, installments of power for what they were called to. But the power that was about to come was not coming by installments. It was not coming by measures. It was not coming with increments because how many know when you get the Holy Spirit, you don't get half a spirit. You don't get half an anointing. You don't get an eighth of an anointing. You get the whole Holy Ghost, amen. You see, it says in John that he whom God had sent and speaks the word of God, God would give his spirit without measure. You say, well, Jason, that was John talking about Jesus. Well, John 20, Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I sent you. In other words, everything he gave me, I'm giving to you. Everything he told me to do, I'm telling you to do. And if you'll do what I did the way that I did it, you'll have the same results and greater. The same and greater. Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost. And again, we're gonna talk more about this next week about the fruit of outpouring and what outpouring looks like every day. Not just on a Sunday, not just on a Thursday, but what does an outpouring look like on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Amen. And so we're gonna look at the fruit of fresh outpouring next week. But Peter stands up in Acts chapter two after uh, you know, explaining to the people that, that they're not drunk the onlookers, the 3,000, as they're, they're mocking the 120 who had found a home in the upper room. Because really it was an upper womb. It was a place of heavenly conception. He said, they're not drunk as you would suppose. It's only 9 a.m. He just said it's too early. But what happened was they recognized that they had been intoxicated with something that had delivered them from the fear of what people thought. And it is oftentimes the fear of what you think someone thinks about you that keeps you from thinking what God thinks towards you. Amen. And so he said, listen, they're not as drunk as you suppose. And he begins to uh, give present prophetic interpretation to Joel's prophetic revelation from Joel chapter two. And then he stands up in Acts 2, 38. And he says this, he says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus. In other words, what they've got, you can get. You see, the kingdom of God is not exclusive, it's inclusive. But there's only one door. He, listen, it is to whosoever will, but you have to make a choice. You see, you, you have to choose Jesus. You have to lay down your life. There is no other way to the Father except through Jesus. And there are a lot of people preaching another Jesus and another gospel in this hour to make the righteous one somehow relevant to an unrighteous culture. 
to say that Jesus will meet you where you are and he'll have no problem with your sin. He loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. He never made an excuse for someone to stay the same because his presence, his goodness, always created something in them to where they recognize there is more. And see, there's something about carrying so much of the Holy Spirit in us that we don't have to preach against what's wrong. We do have to, we do have to uphold a moral standard. The prophetic has to say, this is wrong, this is right. We need preachers of morality, preachers of righteousness. We need tellers of truth, ministers of grace. But how many of you know the presence of God and the anointing can actually bring a revelation to someone's heart to where you can tell them the right thing, but they've got a witness going, yep, this is right. How many of that happened to Zacchaeus? We little man was he. And when Jesus came to his house, Jesus didn't have to tell him he's a thief. It was when the goodness of God came into his life. He said, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give back everything I've stolen, everything I've taken. I'm gonna sell all my goods, give half to the poor, and anybody that I've taken money from wrongly, I'm gonna pay them back four times as much. How many know Jesus didn't come up with that math? Conviction of the Holy Spirit did. And see, when you're so full of the Holy Spirit, God can take one word plus his presence on your life to turn a heart and to turn a city. And so he said, repent and every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Remission means the removal, not just of the sin, but of the sin nature. The operating system in you, the appetite in you, that it is taken out and you shall. It doesn't say you might. It doesn't say you could. It guarantees, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then Peter goes on to say, this gift is a promise. It's a promise of power. Verse 39, for the, the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. In other words, it's available to everybody. He'll pour his spirit out on all flesh. But once he pours his spirit on flesh, flesh must repent of the flesh so that it can live in the spirit. And that's what genuine outpouring does. It creates a God-given desire in the hearts of others to not just live right, but to encounter the one who is righteous to not try to meet a temporal now need that's gonna make you feel less pain in your moment, but you recognize that you've been gripped by eternity and the glory of God has touched you because you were created for that glory. Amen? You see, Jesus did not come simply because you were a sinner. Yes, he had to pay a price for sin, but he came because you were a son and you couldn't see it. And he came to open your eyes. That's what he did on the road to Emmaus when he sat with those two men. And he says that their eyes were open as he broke bread. Broken bread speaks of revelation. It goes on in verse 48. It says that he actually opened up the scriptures to their understanding. He gave them understanding of what they previously could not understand. He opened their eyes. And the Greek word for open actually means the breaking of water and the release of the firstborn. In other words, it's not just, it's, that means that when God begins to speak something to you, it doesn't just open your eye, it opens something in you for what's in you to come out. And the same way Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, he's wanting to not just overshadow us, but to open our eyes that we could birth the glory and the power of God in the earth because there is a world sitting on the edge of their seat looking for the king of glory to encounter them where they're at. And you are the carriers of that glory. And these are the days of birthing and deliverance. So again, Jesus said, I'm gonna send the promise of my father, wait to receive power from on high. Turn to Luke chapter nine, verse one and two. Verse one and two. So many scriptures we could reference. I love Luke 10, I love Matthew 10. So many different Matthew 4, 23, but just two verses I wanna look at. And then I'm gonna give explanation on two words and then we're gonna slide the chairs back and get rowdy in the Holy Ghost. 
Amen? Luke chapter nine, verses one and two, and then verse six. He said, then he called his 12 disciples together. How many of you know that things happen when the right people get together in the right place? See, the Holy Spirit didn't fall on one person. He didn't fall on two people. He didn't even fall on the two or three when he said, I'll be present in their midst. It was 120 with one heart and one mind in one accord in one place. And see, God is looking for that type of unity of spirit in the earth. How do you know it's one thing to be of one heart, it's another thing to be of one mind. And one of the things the Lord spoke to us about at Passover going into this 50 day season is that we were walking into a supernatural season for the renewing of our mind, for the transformation of our lives. How many of you looking back over the last six weeks have gone through some transformation? but it began with changing how you think. It's beginning to think like God. Amen? I've actually been going back and last summer we did a series called Spirit-Filled Thinking. The Lord had me go back. He said, I want you to go back and look at some of this and not just, but we've got several publishers that are wanting to turn into a book and stuff like that. And, you know, I'm praying about some of those things, but um, you want to do the right thing with the right people at the right time and stuff like that. But I went back, I was like, wow, there is so much there that even though we took a whole summer, like I've been going back and unpacking it again. I mean, like, God, I, I don't want to just hear this. I don't want to just know this. I know that I was the one who said this. I was walking in it. But Lord, I want to make sure that I keep this. I want to make sure that, that my eyes don't get off from what you showed me back then. Because how many of you know, because you have something one day does not mean you'll have it forever. It has to be stewarded for increase. Amen. And a steward must first be found faithful. So Luke chapter nine, verse one, he called his 12 disciples together. And he gave them power. Now, this word power is the Greek word dunamis. Say dunamis. Dunamis is where we get our English word dynamite. Come on, where are my J.J. Walkers in the house? Dynamite. Come on, say dynamite. Fun to say. Hallelujah. Say, say it three times and slap your neighbor. I was hoping somebody would really let loose on somebody. He told me, he told me, this is your chance to slap him and blame it on me, amen? Dunamis is the ability, it's the dynamic ability to cause change in the world around you. Dunamis in the Greek is a force. It means miraculous power, miraculous ability. It means abundance. He gave them miraculous power. He gave them supernatural ability. He gave them abundance. And God is desiring to give us a new level of abundance, miraculous power and ability. He, it also can mean strength, violence, vengeance, and mighty, wonderful works. Hallelujah. How many know it says that Jesus was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil and dunamis power taking vengeance on the devil. I know your vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Yes, but he gave power to you. And it's not that you do it in your strength, you do it by his anointing. You know how you make the devil pay? You find someone he's given cancer and you say, not on, not, not on my watch. Because listen, the devil hates losing the trophies he thinks he has in his cabinet. When you go and you begin to reach into someone's life and, and, and darkness and addiction thinks they had them and all of a sudden the goodness of God breaks in and brings them out, how many of you know you're making the devil just, just cussing, hallelujah? He's, you know, I like what Pastor Tim says. He says the devil cusses when he gets up, hallelujah. Making him spitting mad, amen? You ever been spitting mad? I, I think you do that in the South, kind of like you're fixing to do stuff. I still haven't figured out what fixing to do anything means, but... I think it means I'm getting ready to or I'm in the process of thinking about it. All right. <laughs> Dunamis is tangible, demonstrated power. It's tangible. You can feel it. You can see it. You can hear it. Many times the force of dunamis is felt physically and spiritually. That's why dunamis, when someone lays hands on you and if they have dunamis power anointing flowing through them. That's why when you're wired for 110 and you get zapped with their 220, that's why all of a sudden things begin to happen to your body that would not happen if you didn't get touched by the dunamis. Whether you fall down, whether you fly this way, whether all of a sudden you shake, you quake, 
I think there's some manifestations that God has up his sleeve that he hasn't even been able to break out yet. But I say, do it here, God. Lord, if there's anything that you desire to do, just put us on like a glove, just like you did Gideon. Amen. Come on, if you, if you want to do it anywhere, do it here. And I, Listen, I showed up for a show. Hallelujah. I want to see God do some stuff. Does anybody want to see God do some stuff? I'm thankful for what I've seen, but there's so much more that God wants to do. Dunamis power operates by the gift of faith. It is power happening now. You see, dunamis doesn't wait for tomorrow. Dunamis takes the bull by the horns and does it today. Dunamis is raw faith. Dunamis steps into an impossible situation. You look the devil in the eye and you say, the God in me is bigger than the devil in you. Dunamis drives out darkness because dunamis brings a big light. Dunamis power leaps onto people. It leaps into things. That's why Paul's handkerchiefs and aprons brought healing to the sick and deliverance to the press. That's why Teresa, when, 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 we, when we had that day at school and everybody was throwing blankets and aprons and shoes and wallets up on the table because we were talking about the anointing for miracles and she throws her blanket up and all of a sudden you have a friend that comes to you and, that, and, their boy, and her boyfriend had, was paralyzed for 20 years. He'd fallen off a cliff, right? Broke his, broke his back. But guess what? She had faith and she had something that the dunamis had touched. She had a blanket that still had some anointing left in it. And while she was waiting for someone to give it to you, she just wrap up in it and feel God, wouldn't you? You just go home and just get all just in the, in the goodness of God. But she didn't keep it to herself. And I think a lot of times we like to keep the good stuff for us instead of recognizing that the more good we give away, the more glory we'll, we'll, we'll encounter. And so she told her friend, she's like, He's, Michael's going to walk in the name of Jesus. And she, she went and cut three tassels off of her blanket, said, take these and put them under his pillow. Three days later, somebody say three days. He is a paralytic man, paralyzed in a wheelchair, goes back to the doctors who said he would never walk again. And they said, we don't know what you did. And we know he told you we'd never walk again, but somehow things are beginning to work again. And you had a broken back, but now your back's not broken. And so we want you to start going to physical therapy so you can learn to walk again. See, because the miracle wasn't mo- the miracle wasn't walking. The miracle was being able to have the nerves restored. Because what? Dunamis flowed from a person to a material item, was brought by another person of faith to someone in need. And I want to tell you, God is no respecter of people. He's a respecter of faith. I'm thankful for all of the different anointings in the world, but a lot of times we say, well, that's for this person. That's for Benny Hinn. That's for, 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 for this person, that person. Listen, what if God has a whole lot more for you that you think belongs to others? You see, the part of the spirit of wisdom and revelation is it opens your eyes to see what belongs to you. And he's given power. This promise is to you. And that would actually 39 said? He said this gift, this power is to you. He, he promised it to you. Dunamis results start to show immediately. It's the natural realm opening up to the supernatural touch. Oftentimes, a bold action or a simple touch is how dunamis is often transferred and released from one person or one object to another. You can feel it being transferred from yourself to the other person. Jesus said he felt what? Virtue go out of him. Why? Not because somebody touched him, because someone touched him in faith. Because he turned around and said, who touched me? They're like, dude, everybody's touching you. He said, not everybody's touching me the same. How do you touch Jesus? Do you, are, you, are, you, are you casual when you touch him? Bless you. Are you like Jacob and say, I'm not letting go till I get what I need? You see that woman with the issue of blood? She, she said, if I can just, she, she, she came in faith. She came with expectation. She said, if I can get to him, I can be healed. She started to see herself healed and recognize if I can touch him, I can have what I'm seeing on the inside. I see a lot of times faith will cause you to dream a dream on the inside that everybody on the outside will talk you out of if you share with the wrong people. But then you recognize if I can get Jesus and the power in him to agree with what I'm carrying that looks impossible to others, all things will be possible to me. And yes, many people touched him, but only one person touched in faith. Many people probably had things they needed to get healed. They had issues they needed to get resolved. 
but only one person left with her issue being dried up. Amen. A lot of times people want to bring their issues to Jesus and talk about their issues. Instead, what if you just bring your issue and you talk about Jesus? She didn't come given her, her medical history or this doctor did that and this pastor hurt me and da, da, da. she didn't come with her list of offenses. And we owe the world an encounter because we got one. Amen. Dunamis often operates through deep compassion or even a righteous anger or indignation. Oftentimes there is an emotion that is connected to dunamis when the gift of faith comes in the room to where it's what you feel that what's on the inside of you is greater than what your physical form could possibly contain. How many of you have ever felt that to where you're moved with compassion? See, Jesus moved compassion and healed a multitude. And I want to tell you, we'll see the multitudes healed when we learn how to be moved by what Jesus has compassion for. Again, dunamis can be transferred from one person to another person or a person to an object. Dunamis requires a clear, focused channel to flow through oftentimes prepared by prayer, but stirred up in the way that person uniquely knows how to stir up the gift of God within them. And our, our, how many of you know, like our, our pastoral team is, we, they're very different in our anointings and our personalities. And how you know that's the beauty of God, right? God made every snowflake different. We're not all called to look alike, right? But together we all look like Jesus. And how Pastor Joshua prepares for a meeting is probably different than how I prepare for a meeting. How Pastor Jeff prepares for a, a, a service is probably different than how I prepare for a service. Or Pastor Tim or Pastor Jonathan or how many, how many of you know? And if you just simply try to do what somebody else does, you'll find yourself like David wearing Saul's armor. I've got certain songs I have certain things that I'll even go back and I'll watch because the song will trigger an anointing in me. I, I have certain, you know, when I, when I started feeling that healing glory come on me, guess what I did? I went back and I listened and I watched and I sat under the worship that flowed during that ministry. And I wasn't watching the screen, but I was allowing my ear gate to be open to the sound that came into the room when that healing glory came. And that was the first day that we saw, I mean, we, we didn't hear the testimony until the next week, but that was the first day that we saw someone healed of all of the effects of COVID where she lost her sense of taste and smell. I, was, I remember I was standing right here and I said, I see, I see DNA miracles coming down where mRNA has tried to pervert genes and genetic codes and create hormonal imbalance. And I said, and for those of you who can reach out and grab it by faith and begin to touch it to your need, you'll be healed today. And there was a woman standing on this side of the stage who said, well, I haven't tasted or smelled in two years. And she grabbed a hold of that and put it on her. And guess what? She was perfectly restored and got back what the devil had stolen. And then she stands up and gives a testimony the next day because testimonies of dunamis create more dunamis. Because testimonies of what God did create an expectation for what God is about to do. And then we just started seeing literally anyone and everyone who would come in faith, recognizing that the devil has stolen something from me, that they would get back what the enemy has stolen. And how many of you know, listen, that's supernatural. But a lot of times we have reasons that we can, we can get this back, but I can't get that back. But how many of you know Jesus, you can get it all back. But we may have faith for this and not faith for that. It's time to have faith for this and faith for that because dunamis is no respecter of problems. It is the representation of God's power. So he gave them power. He gave them dunamis. Say dunamis. Say dynamite. Dy oh, man, I felt it. Hallelujah. But he didn't just give them dunamis. He didn't just give them power. He gave them authority. He gave them authority. Verse one, he gave them power and authority. And see, the word for authority there is actually another Greek word for power. And it's the word exousia. In fact, there's, there's four Greek words for power in the New Testament. Dunamis, exousia, iscus, and kratos. And all four are in Ephesians 1, 18 through 20. We're going to read it in a minute just to prepare you for your impartation because 
God isn't just wanting us to just have the dunamis. We need the dunamis, but we also need the authority. You see, we, we need the car, but a car without keys ain't going to get you out of the parking lot. Amen. You might get a selfie with it, but you ain't going nowhere. And I think there's a lot of people in ministry and in the church that are taking selfies with someone else's anointing instead of getting the keys to do it themselves. And that's where authority comes in because authority is the keys to access the vehicle of God's power to bring about change and breakthrough in the lives of those around you. He gave them power, dunamis, and authority over all demons. All demons. And I looked in several different Bibles and all of my translations, and I could not find a footnote that excused any demon. In fact, I looked at the original language, and did you know what all means? You've studied this too. It literally means all, every, every single demonic entity, every spirit other than the Holy Spirit. He has given us power and authority over. And see, when Jesus said, I'm going to send the promise of my father, wait till you get power, they had a picture of what power was going to look like. Because Jesus had sent them out before with power to heal and to deliver. And what did they do? They said, we saw Satan fall like lightning. They said it was so much fun. The devils were subject to us in your name. Hallelujah. He said, guys, I've given you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. Nothing will by any means hurt you. And oftentimes the fear of loss keeps us from faith and love. The fear of what you could lose. Oh, what people are going to think. If you care what people are think, you're not going to do much in life. Let alone for God. Anybody great was willing to look like a fool at first. Amen. There's something about being childlike and just saying, I'm going to trust the goodness of my father to meet the needs of others through me. So he gave him power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. But see, because when you preach the gospel of the kingdom, it's not just said, but it has to be seen. It's a demonstration of power. Paul said, the gospel that I preach was in many signs and wonders. He said, it's not an excellence of speech, but in a demonstration of power. So they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So authority over all demons and preaching everywhere. They didn't just preach in the temple. They preached everywhere. They didn't just preach in the house meetings. They preached everywhere. That means when they're in the marketplace, they were preaching and healing the sick. That means that when they were paying the tax collector, they were preaching and healing the sick. That means when they were, they were in between the tax collector and the marketplace, they were looking for sick people to preach the gospel to, to heal the sick and to cast out devils. Everywhere means. And if we have a Christianity we can turn on, it's real easy to get turned off. In other words, we don't, we don't become a different version of ourselves in a certain situation. It is a 24-7 call to be nothing less than Jesus. Because what Jesus did is he said, what the Father has given to me, I'm giving to you. So what are these keys? What does this authority look like? Exousia. It means delegated authority. It is positional power accessed through command. Position. You have been deputized by the divine. And you're not just Barney with a bullet. You are Barney with all the bullets. Because exousia quenches the fiery darts of the enemy. It has authority to bring to nothing what the enemy has tried to do on your watch. It brings governmental shifting and influence for affluence in the earth. Exousia was originally given at creation. That was what God gave Adam when he said, be fruitful, multiply, have dominion, and subdue it. Exousia was always God's plan. But they what? They gave it up. They gave away the authority, but Jesus went and got the keys back. And for a season of time, the enemy had a level of authority, but he no longer has any authority because Jesus took it all back and he regifted it to you. All authority has been given to you. So Exusia was originally given at creation. It was lost in the fall of man, but it was regained through the redemption at the cross. 
The word exousia in Greek means delegated influence, authority, jurisdiction, liberty, power, right, strength, freedom. See, and the thing about exousia is you don't have to feel anointing to use it. You know, dunamis, I'll often feel it. Exousia is based on what you know. I'm so thankful for Kenneth Hagin and, and, and the authority of the believer. And see, exousia is not just reserved for a special person and a special purpose. Exousia is an authority given to every believer to exercise the power we've been given in the Holy Spirit. It operates by a knowing on the inside that your words command and shape the spirit realm and the natural. That everything created must bow to the word of God in your mouth when the power of the Holy Spirit, when dunamis and exousia work together, watch out, Jack. All of a sudden, things that could not move begin to move and they begin to shake. Exousia operates by the Mark 11, 23 and 24 believer's faith. That if anyone, anywhere will speak to this mountain, be plucked up and cast into the sea. They didn't talk about the mountain, he spoke to the mountain. And exousia speaks to a problem, not about a problem. When exousia begins to talk about a problem, that's when a problem begins to grow because you're giving an authority to a problem, not a promise. Exousia operates by exercising God-given rights. This positional power causes both angels and demons to move. Psalm 1 and 320, bless the Lord you as angels who excel in strength, heeding the voice of his Word. Again, exousia oftentimes is accompanied or operates by the spoken word. And it's not your word. It's not my word. It's his word that accomplishes what he sent it to do. Exousia at its strongest. And how many of you know, listen, we're called to exercise our authority. You don't just use what you've got. We're called to increase everything we have. God gives it as a seed, he supplies it. But as we begin to give it away and steward it, he multiplies it. And then he increases the fruit of it. And exousia in its strongest form will operate through, a, through the presence of a person to bring governing influence over an atmosphere and economic shifting to a political climate. That's why God will put people and a place of spiritual governance that their presence and their power when they speak the word of God can literally change the landscape of a city. That's what Isaiah 61 says, that the anointing would not just open blind eyes and prison doors, but it would cause cities to be rebuilt, redeemed, and restored because the blessing of the righteous exalts a city. It lifts it higher. And this is why the enemy has worked so hard to get righteous voices to agree with an unrighteous alignment, to cause us to be distracted by less than God's best and to be preoccupied with problems that are temporal instead of be possessed by the promise of God's power. I learned this several years ago because I'm a fixer. I'm a justice guy. I see stuff wrong. I want to pick up a jawbone of an ass and go after him. It's King James. I can say that. I just want to go, ah, there's a thousand wrong people doing the wrong thing. I'm going to be one person that makes it go right. But how many of you know that's my strength? Moses did the same thing. What did he do? Killed an Egyptian. Why? Was the Egyptian doing something wrong? Yes. But he did it in an unrighteous way because he killed him in his time and his season. And what he did was he dealt with him out of anger that was unrighteous. And I don't know about you, but I've done a lot in my life to go back and say, God, I tried to do the right thing, but I did it from the wrong place. I did it to try to protect people I love instead of preserving what you love. See, you can try to protect and you can try to preserve. Preserve is, preserve, preserve is what you, you're doing it for something. Protect means you're having to make somebody a villain. villain. How many know what I'm talking about? And what that does is it perverts God's power. And it actually causes you to either give up your authority or to misuse it. And I'll tell you this, authority unused is authority abused. 
authority. We've been given authority, but if you don't use it, you've actually abused what you've been given. Does this make sense? And one of the things that I recognized in my life is that just because you have authority in one season doesn't mean you'll have authority in the next season if you step out of alignment with your assignment. This is why Uzziah, I mean, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. There was something, listen, it wasn't just about seeing the Lord high and lifted up. There was something about King Uzziah dying that caused him to see something he hadn't seen before. King Uzziah was a king, First Chronicles chapter 26, incredible king. His name meant the strength of God. His dad's name meant God will strengthen. His mom's name meant God will enable. This guy had everything going for him, right? He was the who's who. And it said that God helped him marvelously until he became strong. He actually was an inventor of all kinds of new weapons. He was the guy that came up with catapults and bows and airs. Like he had all of this weaponry that nobody had had before because God had helped him. But when he began to take credit in his life for what God did for him, and when he was anointed to be king, but he tried to get out of his lane and function as a priest, he was struck with leprosy. And what happens is when we try to get out of our lane, out of our assignment. When I say lane, we are kings and priests in the new covenant. How many of you are thankful for that? Kings, priests, and prophets. I'm talking about a lane that you're no longer yoked with the Lord. When we break that yoke, that is easy and that burden that is light, to yoke ourselves up with the spirit of this world or to try to fix a wrong thing in our own power, we can find ourselves in a place that something in us needs to die too. Has anybody ever been there? And this is part of how we prepare our lamps for his oil. Has anybody else ever tried to take up a righteous cause in your strength? How'd that work out for y'all? Me neither. Me neither. I remember Tina telling me, she's like, she's like, Jason, she's like, you, you, you create such atmospheres. You can either create like an atmosphere of faith, like you walk in and it's like, man, anything is possible. Or all of a sudden you watch a certain news show and all of a sudden it's like the, the life gets sucked out of our home. You can start talking about supply chain shortages and all of a sudden everybody thinks they're not gonna have anything. Or you can say, hey, listen, God can take two fish and five loaves and all of a sudden they have faith for anything. And I wanna tell you, you know why? It's because we've been given power and authority. You see, anything the believer says or does will be magnified for others to see. You see, when the world does something, it's in the measure that they do it. When a believer does it, it's magnified 30, 60, and 100 fold. And that's why so many of us have had to fight to get focus. And in areas where we found ourselves out of focus, we had to fight to get back to focus. That was one of the things I was so, I was so thankful when the Lord, I had that encounter last April where the Lord came to me and gave me the justice and mercy coin that had sent me on the spirit filled thinking thing. Because what he did was he said, Jason, do not be conformed to this world. Don't be shaped by what's happening to you but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How many recognize over these last three years that the world around you has tried to shape you? But guess what, you're still here. So that actually mean, must mean that you're in more of a transformation than you thought. You're not being conformed from the outside, you're being transformed from the inside. And see, in that place, you can pick down what you picked up in your own strength, and you can recognize that in my place of praise, he'll begin to fight for me. Isn't that what Moses found? You see, Moses saw the greatest victory, not when he lifted his hand against an enemy, but when he lifted his hands to God. That was when they gave a great victory where Joshua was able to defeat the Amalekites, the backbiting people. Does this make sense? So again, exousia operates by God-given rights as positional power. It can bring governmental influence in the earth, but it requires a solid knowledge of the word and boldness in your position with the risen and reigning Christ as a son of God. So you have to know who you are and whose you are and what you're called to do. Everybody go ahead and stand to your feet. I'm gonna invite Pastor Jeff and the worship team to come. And I'm gonna pray for you what Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter one. And then we're gonna lay hands on you. But here's what I wanna say, listen, the thing about dunamis, dunamis can work with or without you. In other words, when somebody's walking in the gift of faith in the dunamis, it'll, it, 
it just flows. But when it is multiplied is when there's faith on both sides. When, like the woman with the issue of blood, when she's like, man, if I, if I can just get this, my life will be changed. And see, dunamis doesn't require faith on the recipient to work, but it is oftentimes multiplied in its effectiveness when both parties are coming in faith. And one of the things I can tell you is today when I pray for you, I'm coming in faith. How many of you are going to come to receive in faith? Saying, Lord, I want more than what I've got. I recognize there's more to be had. And this is what Paul prayed in Ephesians 1. He said, therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding, and I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened today, that you would know that you would encounter. That word know in the, in the Greek is gnosko. It was actually not just to have knowledge of, but it was a Jewish idiom for sexual intercourse between a man and a woman. You see, the, when you know God, you're impregnated by God. That's why Daniel could say those who know their God are strong and do what? Great exploits. He goes on to say that you, their eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you would know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? The riches of his glory in you. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? That's dunamis. The exceeding greatness of his miraculous ability toward us who believe. According to the working of his mighty power. The word mighty there is the Greek word iskis, which means force, power, or strength. And then that word power is not dynamis, but it's kratos. Kratos is demonstrative and eruptive. The picture of kratos is a volcano busting at the seams. In fact, a historical study of the word kratos, the word kratos was most used in the story of Hercules in Greek mythology. Now, of course, we don't ascribe to Greek mythology, but it was the only word they could use to describe the strength and the power that Hercules had. In Ephesians, Paul prayed that that power, that Hercules, that superhuman strength would come upon you, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, which is exousia, and might, dominion, and dominion, kratos, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And if you say, Jason, I I want the eyes of my heart to be enlightened, and I want all four of those powers. I want that superhuman God strength to come upon me. I want that miraculous ability. I want that delegated authority. I want that influence. I want that jurisdiction. I want the force of God, the virtue of God, the vengeance of the Lord to begin to work through my life to destroy the works of the devil. I don't want you to walk to the front. I want you to run. And I want you to come with hunger. I want you to come in faith. And we're going to press in in personal prayer for a moment. And then we're going to line up shoulder to shoulder. The ushers are going to begin to move the chairs back. But I want you to press into the Lord for a moment. I want us to get into a place of faith as Pastor Jeff and the team begin to lead us into this atmosphere because there's an atmosphere of faith. There's an atmosphere of power. There's an atmosphere of glory. It's what David went after in Psalm 63. He said, oh God, you're my God. Early will I seek you. I've longed for you to see your power, to taste your glory. And I don't know about you, but I'm longing to see and to encounter and to experience a greater level of God's power and a greater level of His glory because the world needs it now. Come on.
Come on. Come on, he said he gives to those who ask. Come on, use this time to be asking for that power, asking for that fire. I just felt dunamis coming in the room. I want to ask you just to go ahead and line up shoulder to shoulder with the person next to you. And make sure there's about six feet between you and the person in front of you. We'll move chairs back. But I want everyone to have enough room to be able to fully receive. And I'll say this. You don't have to be slain in the spirit to receive. Although many people are. What I would encourage you though, is if you go down, don't be quick to get up. The greatest anointings in my life have not been when I was touched by a person, but it was when the touch of them became my touch. It was, I, I received dunamis from them, but then I laid under the anointing and I enveloped, I began to wrap my life around it. And I, I would go into deeper levels of God's presence and glory. So I encourage you, if you do go down, stay down and just invite it to increase. Because in that moment, you'll learn more about the anointing and you'll encounter more of his power to where you don't just need another touch, but you wonder, you begin to look what the transformation is in you and begin to enter into that miraculous anointing. So let's go back into that, Jeff. Shayara Shumbo, Hai Shayara Mundo. 
more, 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 Hey, Shatara Mandai. Oh, Shandara Bahata. Oh, Shamara Baba. Shamba, there it is. Mandaya Shumbaya baba baba, hosh shamara baba, hosh shamara baba, hosh shamara baba. More, more. separation in the shoulder no separation no separation no separation between the word and the spirit
He's got an anointing to gather and guard. Evangelist and pastor, you got an anointing.
Hallelujah.
Of course, when Jesus gave power, dunamis, and authority, exousia, he sent them out. And he said, everywhere you go, let your peace come upon those people and come upon that place. Heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, love the lost, and reveal the Father. And so, Lord, I thank you, Lord, even as this precursor to Pentecost, Lord, that we are a people of your promise. And I ask that as we go forth from this place, that everyone we come in contact with would encounter your presence because you are with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You don't want to miss next Sunday, Pentecost. Hallelujah. We'll see you then.